Hi there, I'm Danny Flex and welcome to the latest edition of Seconds Out Reflections. I'm here every Monday at 4.30pm to look back on the boxing action of the weekend just gone. And on Saturday, for the first time in almost two years, I actually attended a live arena show. Um, I usually have my son at weekends, but he spent Halloween with his mum this year. And uh, that meant that I was back in an arena um, amongst the other uh, boxing scribes and fans, or family at least, of the fighters, as it turned out. Uh, watching a show that ranged from the sublime in places to the ridiculous um, in one notable fight. But we'll go through all that. Let's start with the positives. Um, Chantel Cameron looked as good as she ever has in uh, unifying the WBC and IBF super lightweight titles in a kind of semi-final of the tournament that they're um, staging at the moment to crown one undisputed champion at the weight. Um, the next one's either next week or the week after. And then Cameron will fight the winner in early spring next year. Um, but she was already the WBC champion and came in and took the IBF belt from Mary McGee, who was brave and tough and dogged, but ultimately outclassed. Um, it was a pretty dominant performance. Cameron um, was quicker of hand and of foot, um, had a more versatile skill set as well. Um, McGee came in with 15 knockouts on her record, but didn't look like a massive puncher. And early on, at least, the technical uh, expertise on display was minimal, I think it's fair to say. And that, and that includes from Cameron, it just seemed like a bit of a scrap, but... As the time went on, Cameron showed her class, um, moving in and out, uh, quick feet and landing quick bursts and then avoiding the follow-ups or the counters for the most part from McGee. Cameron's left hook to the body was particularly impressive. Um, and a lot of people were surprised that McGee remained standing, was not knocked down or stopped um, in the fight. But Cameron never really landed that one clean head or body shot that would really take someone out and you watch the video and you might think that's rubbish because <laughs> McGee certainly soaks up a lot of punishment but she never really landed that clean kind of knuckles turned over textbook shot that would have maybe ended her night but let's give her all the credit um the Indiana lady fought very hard um she was proud she didn't want to give up her title without a fight and she particularly as the in the later rounds really gave it her best the last round as well I think one of the issues with women's fights being over two minute rounds instead of three is that they whiz by and when someone gains an advantage there's like how many times you heard it in a men's fight where someone's in trouble and they say oh there's over a minute left in the round I mean that's very very rare in the female side of the sport because even if you get someone in trouble you're often already in the second half of the round um, so that's maybe another argument to make it three minute rounds but then maybe it's an argument against it as well because we don't want to see people take unnecessary punishment um, but McGee certainly took a lot of punishment and wasn't knocked out. So fights like that tend to be the ones where fighters get injured as well. In that, you know, if they're knocked out early, the punishment's over early. And the damage of that big shot is obviously um, devastating at times. But they've missed out on another six, seven, eight rounds, however long, of further damage. Um, so it's, it's one to kind of weigh up. But I've gone off on a bit of a tangent. Cameron's performance was mature and composed um, for someone who's only been a champion for a short amount of time and if she continues to grow in the tournament you would favour her to beat either of the other two ladies in the final and become undisputed um, and then we can or they can look at Katie Taylor showdown perhaps next year so that was really good also I thought the fight between Jorge Castaneda and Yusuf Kamari fight of the night on paper kind of lived up to its billing um, kind of a slow technical start but really sprung into life around halfway through. I had Kamari winning by a point, um, but had no uh, quarrel with the decision, majority decision that went to Castaneda, who gets his second big uh, upset win or away win after um, ending the unbeaten record of former amateur star Otha Jones III last time out. He was, he was tough, he hit hard, and he never stopped coming. And um, he didn't lose belief in his ability to um, nail Kamari and to hurt him even while he was getting outboxed in the early rounds. Kamari certainly the slicker, um, better skill set, but just got gradually kind of ground down, pulled into a, the type of fight that didn't really suit his style, and um, was pipped at the post. I mean, he can come again. I think he'll be he'll be better for the experience. But for Castaneda, after those two 
good wins in a row. I'd like to see him in the home corner next time out. Something I put to uh, promoter Eddie Hearn in the post-fight press conference, which you can watch on the channel. Um, and he seemed keen uh, for, for the same outcome as well. Um, so that, that they were kind of the main highlights. Also, Johnny Fisher's support, Romford Ball, still unbeaten um, after destroying Alvaro Torero of Spain. Um, good performance. Matador against the ball. No one really used that, unfortunately. So I've used it now. Um, yeah, the Romford Ball got the job done. Pleased his 1,500 or so loud supporters. The only uh, negative part of that is that they all left after his fight and there was still a couple of contests to go. But they, I, I passed some of them when I was on the way to the arena. They already seemed kind of well lubricated and um, were, were getting to the O2 well before he was there. So they created a great atmosphere even before Fisher's fight, but, you know, understandably decided to, to take a hike after he got rid of Torero in, in quick and impressive fashion. You know, he is improving gradually and they're not rushing him, which I think is important given he's still quite young. He came to the sport quite late, um, but he's got the fundamentals. He's got the raw power. So it's going to be interesting to watch his journey under Mark Tibbs. Then we've got the flip side. And before I talk about the uh, Babich Molina fight, which was just ridiculous, um, I just want to mention there was a couple of what I felt were late stoppages on the fight from pretty one inexperienced referee, one in John Latham, who's a bit more um, experienced. And just seemed like there, there was a desire to see fighters take a, a you know, a, a significantly visible amount of punishment before stepping in. And I think it's always better to err on the side of caution, especially if it's a fight where the loser is clearly not going to win. Um, and I felt there were some issues there. And, and that includes in the uh, Babich fight, although I, I understand the massive question marks about Molina's effort. But even then, if a boxer's not trying, and you can clearly see he's constantly looking for a soft spot on the canvas to fall over, what benefit does it do to him, the winner, or the paying public to, you know, perpetuate and, and keep it going. Surely, you know, even if that's the reason, even if you suspect that, rule him out. And you can decide, the board can decide later on if his non-effort um, qualifies as not trying and a withholding of some of his purse. So, yeah, Babich got rid of Molina, round two. Uh, what, three knockdowns in total or four knockdowns in total? The first round was the only genuine knockdown of the bunch. Um, Babich came forward, rumbled forward as he normally does, took a long, hard right hand as he came in, but uncorked his own shorter right hand at the same time, which dropped Molina heavily in his corner. He got up and seemed happy enough to continue. But as we've seen from Molina, that ambition only lasts so long now that he's no longer in world title class. And the drummer boy uh, went down a further, yeah, I think it was three times, um, none of which looked like particularly clean shots. And just seemed to, to want a way out. Um, Eddie Hearn said afterwards, that's the last payday he's getting from me. Um, and we hope that's true. Um, because I think after the kind of poor effort against Fabio Wardley, after buzzing Wardley early on and then just completely capitulating, I don't think we need to see Molina against any more heavyweights. Don't bring him back for Johnny Fisher. You know, even if that's in, in anyone at Matchroom's mind. Just don't do it. Um, as for Babich, he did what he had to do. But still looks raw. Um, still looks open as he as he attacks. There's still the question marks over his stamina um, if he's taken into the late rounds. He's clearly got a decent chin because he's taken um, hefty shots from opponents who are a lot, lot heavier than him. But presumably by someone more durable and more able to cope under the incessant pressure he produces, he, he is you know vulnerable to being outboxed. But we need to see him step up now. It's a bit like Jake Paul, albeit uh, he's obviously a lesser degree and that people were saying for ages, Jake Paul needs to fight a proper boxer. And, and he is now, of course, as uh, my colleague John Houston will be talking about tomorrow uh, against Tommy Fury. It's similar with Babich. We need to see him against a genuine threat. Someone who's qualified to give him a fight and who comes in believing and wanting to win. Um, you know, Molina's got the credentials as a two-time former world title challenger, but it was clear going in that whatever ambition he once had had long since passed. Um, and some of the other guys Babbage has fought on the way out were acceptable, considering he'd only had a, a small number of pro fights. But now, at the stage where he is and talking about, you know, he, he seems to want to step up. He's talking about fighting Hergovic, for example, who's on the fringes of a world title shot. You know, we need to see him in a proper test. Um you know, someone someone relatively durable, or at least, a, you know, who has proved durable against a certain level of opposition. But that takes a bit of money, especially if he's insistent on staying at heavyweight rather than moving down to bridge weight or cruiserweight. 
Eddie Hearn may have to dip his hand in his pocket. I know he mentioned likes of Artur Spilka um, after the fight, but I'd like to see someone you know better than that. Why not put Babich in with a with a Chisora? You know, everyone would back Chisora. I understand that, but it'd be an all action fight while it lasted. Babich would lose very little from a defeat to Chisora. He could still you know go on with his career. I guess the main point is would Chisora be up for it? But if it's a big money fight, and I think it could be sold as one. Then why not? Not every fight has to be a pay-per-view headliner. The zone at the moment, at least, don't do pay-per-view anyway. But if not Chisora, then at least someone who's likely to come with a bit of bit of ambition, you know, an unbeaten European or American heavyweight who wants to make an impression, who's got their own kind of career path mapped out, rather than someone who's late on in their career uh, or has already had some losses. You know, we need to see Babich pushed because as much as he's popular and exciting. We can't have any more farcical uh, spectacles like we saw at the weekend. It does the sport no good. And for someone who's tuning into The Zone for the first time, I can't imagine it does much for their subscriber base either. We all like to see Babich kind of rolling forward, smashing into people, but we'd like to see him get a bit back beyond, you know, one or two punches and then the fight are crumbling. Um, so, yeah, that that's my thoughts on that one. Obviously, I want to know what you guys think. I should mention Ellie Scottney as well. Um, went eight rounds for the first time against Ava Cantos of Spain. Good performance there. She seemed to maybe switch off a little bit. Unsure, perhaps, of going uh, eight rounds for the first time. So, rounds five and six seemed to fade a little bit and then came back strong in round seven. Always, you know, more skillful and busier um, than her opponent. But Cantos was decent, worked well. On the perimeter, popping out the jab and following up occasionally with right hands as well. A bit of ambition there, but um, Scottney just the, the better um, all-round fighter. Uh, but yeah, I want to know what you guys think of the show generally. Um, let me know what you enjoyed and what you didn't. I'll be back on Thursday for Flex Expectations, looking ahead, of course, to Canelo against Caleb Plant. We'll have lots of Canelo Plant content across the channel this week, so stay tuned. And I'll be back next Monday for the following uh reflections uh 4 30 p.m once again really appreciate your time as always and i'll see you all soon